Good morning again. I'm Phil Cruz. I'm one of the pastors here at Raincon Mountain. And we're a church that is uh, faithful to the Scriptures. We um, are faithful in order to know, live, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, we do that because we believe that God uses the proclamation of the gospel to multiply disciples and churches. So we're glad that you're here today, glad that you're part of the worship service. Would you turn with me in your Bibles or on your devices to Isaiah chapter 52? Isaiah chapter 52, beginning at verse 13. Now, I'll just tell you up front that uh, there are many that would say that these last three verses of Isaiah 52 really ought to be the first three verses of Isaiah 53. So if I refer to them as Isaiah 53 today, you'll get why. But they're really part of the same song. They're part of the fourth servant song, uh, describing the servant that God sends to deliver his people. So Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, verse 12. This is the word of God. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his... Tri as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. O oh Lord God, will you now come to us by your Spirit, helping us understand your word, making sense of all that you have in store for us so that we might better serve you. Equip us through your word, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So as we start this morning, I, I just want to make a few general comments about the book of Isaiah that perhaps I've not mentioned in the past. Uh, the book of Isaiah is uh, comprised of 66 chapters. Uh, the Bible has 66 books. Uh, the book of Isaiah is divided into two sections. The first section is uh, chapters 1 through 39, and the second section is chapters 40 through 66. 
Uh, That first section of the book of Isaiah largely recounts the history of Israel and its sins, as does the first part of the Bible, uh, chapters 1 through 39. Uh, The second part of Isaiah largely tells us about the coming Messiah, uh, those last 27 chapters. And the last 27 chapters of the Bible tell us about the Messiah who came. So there are a number of similarities uh, between the book of Isaiah and the Bible in general. Um, Spurgeon said that um, the Bible or the the book of Isaiah was the Bible in miniature. A couple other things about the book of Isaiah. That second section uh, begins with telling us about the the prophet who had come before the Lord and prepare the way for the Lord. And that's how the, the New Testament begins is with the ministry of John the Baptist who came to prepare the way for the Lord. Uh, the, the last part of the New Testament, the ending to the New Testament, gives us a picture of uh, the coming heavens and, and earth. Uh, the last chapter of Isaiah ends with a description of the new heavens and the new earth. So again, a lot of similarities. When we come to this chapter, chapter 53, as I said, uh, Spurgeon said it is uh, the Bible in miniature. Uh, he also said is, it is the essence of the gospel uh, here in Isaiah 53. In fact, other scholars have said that perhaps uh, Isaiah 53 ought to be considered the fourth gospel. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Isaiah 53 because it so clearly tells us the message of the gospel. Martin Luther believed that every believer should commit it to memory. So Isaiah 53 is a very important book. In fact, so, so important that it is the Old Testament book or chapter that is most quoted in the New Testament. Over 80 times Isaiah 53 is quoted in the New Testament. Last week we looked at the first part of Isaiah 52 and we looked at the, the reality that your God reigns and he's the one who delivers captives out of slavery, delivering us out of slavery to sin. And chapter 53 is how he accomplishes that. It's all about the servant, the servant that comes and takes us out of slavery to sin. And so that's what we're going to look at today, and we can't miss the main point. I want you to take this home with you, think about it through the week. It's very simple. Jesus in your place for your sins. Jesus in your place for your sins. That's really what Isaiah 53 is all about. Jesus in your place for your sins. Sins. We're going to take a look at how Isaiah shows us that in three different descriptions of the suffering servant. Uh, He tells us, first of all, about the exaltation of the servant, and then the atonement of the servant, and then the the, uh, victorious servant, or the victory of the servant. So first of all, the exaltation of the servant. Now, look at uh, verse 13 of chapter 52. It says this, it says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Some of you are aware that uh, our little hiking dynamo, Carolee Sherrard, uh, will be hiking the Grand Canyon this week, uh, celebrating her 81st birthday. Uh, That's not how I would celebrate my 81st. I'd be glad to still be walking on my 81st birthday but she's going to go Tuesday. She'll be in the canyon on Tuesdays, down the South Kaibab, across the Tonto, back up the Bright Angel, 13-something miles. Uh, supposed to be snowing that day. Uh, so pray for her. It'll be a wonderful experience, I'm sure. But the Grand Canyon has to be one of my favorite places in the world. You cannot go to the Grand Canyon without standing at the rim in utter awe of the grandeur of that canyon. It is, after all, the Grand Canyon. But it is is full of grandeur. You you cannot help but stand there. And I I hope hope she's driving up tomorrow. I hope she gets there in time for sunset. It's the best time at the rim. And you just stand there and you take it all in. You take in the grandeur. And that's exactly what God is directing us to do here with His servant. You know, I, I've got to believe the most, the most frequently uttered word at the rim is either wow or look. Look, just look at that. Look, 
Look at that. Behold. And that's what, that's what God says here at the beginning of this verse is, Behold my servant. Look at my servant. Check him out. Look at him. Get caught up in his grandeur. And he calls him my servant. This is God the Father calling his son my servant. And you know what? Jesus owns it. Jesus owns that title. He's not like us who would say, oh, I don't want to be called servant. I'm not, that's, a, no. No, he owns that. In fact, in one of his most astounding proclamations of his, of his identity, of his purpose, of his mission, he says in Mark chapter 10, and even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to be a servant. He came to serve God. He came to serve himself up to God as he serves us. He owns being a servant. And this servant, God says in, chapter, or in verse 13, he says, Behold my servant, look at him who acts wisely. Behold my servant shall act wisely. And it's, it's important, it's necessary that that God say this about his servant here at the beginning of this song about the servant because everything that follows doesn't seem all that wise. Like, really, that's your plan? You're going to give up your life for a bunch of sinners like, like us? That's, that's all you got? That's the best thing you got? Is that really wise? Yes, it is absolutely wise. It is the only solution for us. It's the only way it could happen. It was for God to become man himself and to take on our sin, to be that suffering servant. And he had to go to the depths of his humiliation before he would be exalted. When we think about Jesus and his humiliation and his exaltation, I, I'm hoping that your mind's where my, went where my, my, my mind goes when I think about that. And that is to that beautiful hymn that, Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2. That's that hymn where he says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every, name, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The humiliation of the servant was complete. It was utter. It was to the depths. And that humiliation comes prior to his exaltation. Isaiah goes on to say, As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So you know, when Jesus came, his appearance was so marred that he was unrecognizable. And that was, that's referring to when he came that last week, during those last days, those last hours, as he was led away from Pilate and beaten by the soldiers, beat up, slugged, hit across the face over and over again. But then not only that, he, he, was, he was scourged. And if you're familiar with what scourging is, scourging is when you have a, a, a whip or maybe you have a, a whip or a set of uh, leather strands that are tied to a long rod and the rod is used as a whip. And on the end of each of those strands is tied uh, a piece of glass or a piece of metal or a piece of stone or a piece of wood that's sharp. And so the idea is that as that, that victim is being scourged, as they're being whipped, those little pieces of stone and glass and wood catch on the skin and the skin is pulled off of the person being whipped. And so the, the person being whipped, his, his body is flayed open, oftentimes internal organs being exposed. And so this is what Jesus endured. And so he's, he's, um, he's, he's been beaten by the soldiers and then, and then he's scourged. And then he has that crown of thorns thrust on his head so that it certainly passes through his skin, if not his skull itself. 
And so he's covered in blood. He has a, he's wearing a mask of blood and a shroud of blood so that he's, as he's brought again back to Pilate, it's likely they had to tell him, this is Jesus. Because he's there, he has the semblance of man. He's standing, he's upright, unbelievably, but he, he's not recognizable. This is Jesus whom you condemned. That's what happened to Jesus as he underwent the suffering intended for us, that, that scourging, that, that penalty uh, for our sin. He takes upon the, the punishment that we are due. And it's that blood that flowed from him that is mentioned in the beginning of cha- uh, verse 15. So he shall sprinkle many nations. And this is referring to the atonement. So we're going to come back to it in a moment. But God, God calls us to, to behold this servant, to behold his servant, who will go to the uttermost point of being humiliated, even to the point of death, and that being death on a cross. He goes to that point of humiliation and then is exalted. He is the exalted one. He will be exalted. And, and his ex- exaltation actually begins on the cross. It's in his cross and the cross that he is paying for our sin that he is glorified by the father even as jesus himself says in john chapter 3 as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the son of man be lifted up so that those who believe in him may have eternal life and he was lifted up and his exaltation comes later as well as he's resurrected and as he sent ascends into heaven and as he is seated at the right hand of the father but he has to go through this humiliation before he's exalted he will suffer much for the sins of his people but it says that kings shall shut their mouths because of him for that which was not has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand we know that this is true that there are many kings that jesus was paraded in front of uh, the, the kings of the Jews, as it were, the Sanhedrin, the council, the, the elders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priests. They saw him and they marveled at him, as did Herod and Pilate and, and those kings and rulers that Paul was, was brought before. As they, as they understood, as they heard the mystery of the gospel, as the mystery unfolded, They came to understand, and yet they did not believe. They rejected the truth of the gospel. He will go through incredible humiliation, but he is the exalted one. This is our Savior. This is the suffering servant. He is the exalted servant. And, And then we look at the atonement of the servant. The atonement of the servant. So going back to Isaiah 52, 15 for just a moment. Uh, so he shall sprinkle many nations. This perfect servant, this substitutionary servant will sprinkle many nations. And the picture that we ought to have of this is that of Jesus being the great high priest who enters into the Holy of Holies as that high priest entered once a year into the Holy of Holies to provide atonement for the people with the blood of a bull that he would sprinkle on the mercy seat that covered the, the Ark of the Covenant in which the law of God was kept. So this law that had been broken, the blood is sprinkled over the law that was broken to, to cover the sin of the people, to atone for the sin. The payment price was blood. And that's what Jesus does for the nations, for people of every tribe and language and tongue. He he sprinkles, his blood is sprinkled over the nations to bring about salvation, to set the captives free. This is the heart of the gospel. He provides the payment that is necessary. Paul put it this way. He said, "For for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know, I heard uh, the gospel described this way recently. I'd never heard it put this way before, but it makes a lot of sense. And that is simply this, that the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God. And the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. 
You see, what we do as man, what sin is, is rebellion it's got against God. It's saying, no, I want to be God. I want to be my own God. I want to direct my ways. I know what's best for me. I'm going to satisfy my own desires, my way, my time. That's the essence of sin. But the essence of salvation is God saying, no, I'm, you, you, can't do th- you can't do it. It's not going to be effective. It's not going to work. You'll never make it. So I'm going to substitute myself for you. I'm going to come and save you. I'm going to step into your place for your sin. And that's at the heart of this chapter, chapter 53. It's just such an unbelievable story, isn't it? And that's why Isaiah says at the beginning of verse, uh, chapter 53, proper, uh, he says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? We know that people reject The gospel reject that Jesus came for them, for the world. That he, the one who made the world was rejected by the world. He came to his own people and they would not receive him. John says, uh, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? You know, we, we often wonder why, why our unsaved friends and family members don't believe. We wonder that about the Jews. We wonder why the Jewish people don't see it, because after all, this is part of their Bible. This is part of their scriptures. But oftentimes, the Isaiah 53 is not allowed to be read in the synagogues because it so clearly points to Jesus as the Messiah. The prophecies are fulfilled. The statements are made that are clear that Jesus is the Messiah. It's so clear, and yet they reject because they have a faith. They have, a, they have an understanding, a belief. I can do it on my own. I can earn my own righteousness. I can, I can get by. I'm, I'm good enough the way I am. I can follow the law. And yet that, we know that that never works, that never succeeds. The atoning sacrifice, the one who came to pay the sacrifice, is rejected. You know, no other religion has the humiliation of God at its heart. It just is unfathomable to think that someone would create a whole belief system around God becoming a man and dying. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. And yet he had no form or majesty that we should look upon him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Jesus is despised and rejected and betrayed, paying the price for our sin, becoming sin for us. You know, uh, Shelley and I watch, uh, have watched all the Marvel movies uh, at least once. Um, we watch, uh, we're watching The Falcon and the Winter Soldier right now on Disney Channel. And uh, uh, we watch those because we, we like them, but more so because our kids watch them and we want to have a point of contact to talk about things with our kids. Uh, so we watch the Marvel adventures, right? The Marvel universe. But the, the amazing thing is that, or maybe not so amazing, uh, is that all of the heroes, all of the superheroes are beautiful people. They're gorgeous. Even the men. I can say that as a man. Like, so there's a new, I don't know if you know this, there's a new Captain America. That guy's good looking. He, he really, he's got long blonde hair, he's got blue eyes, he's, he's, uh, he's a stud, he just, he was a former um, collegiate athlete, uh, star quarterback, he received accommodations from the military, so he's, he is Captain, he's Mr. America, he's red, white, and blue. And that's the image that we have of heroes. We have this idealized view of what a hero looks like, what someone we depend on, someone we look to looks like. But that's not who Jesus was, right? Jesus was not that figure. He was despised. He had no majesty or form. He was rejected over and over. 
He was nothing to look at. And yet, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. This is the substitutionary atonement that we read here and in verse 5 and in verse 8 and verse 10 and verse 12. Listen to the pronouns of verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Jesus in our place for our sins. Jesus in your place for your sins. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know, when we read that verse, we we think about the sheep that have gone astray. And we think, well, sure. I mean, sheep are dumb. They're going to wander they're going to go wherever they want. They're going to see some grass that looks good. They're going to wander over there. They're going to wa- no, but, but the idea that, that Isaiah is communicating here is the idea of going the opposite direction. It's not just a meandering. It's a straying opposite to where they would actually find health and what they really need. And that's what we do when it says that our iniquities are laid upon him. It's that idea of missing the mark. So the sheep are out there missing a mark. We are all like sheep. We wander, we go astray. As the old hymn would say, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. I go this way, God is that way. And it's that misdirection, it's that straying that was laid upon Jesus, that was put upon our Savior. And he was oppressed and afflicted, and he opened not his mouth. Have you ever heard anybody suffering that didn't open their mouth? When you suffer and when you hurt, you cry out, or at least I do. Suffering people moan and groan, but he opened not his mouth. He suffered in silence. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. There is a picture here that we dare not miss. Sheep love to be shorn. So sheep grow this coat of wool beginning in the spring after their last time that they're shorn and they grow this wool um, uh, and, and by winter time, it's nice and warm. It keeps them warm through the winter. And then as it's coming back to springtime, it's heavy. It's full of dirt, weeds that they've been laying in, smelly, stinks. And so they come and they stand before their shears silently. It's not like they have to be coaxed into getting rid of this big coat of wool as they're heading into summer. They have the coat of wool shorn off of them and I've seen this personally I grew up on the reservation and and they're they're shepherds they're shepherd people and rams and ewes that have that thick coat of wool shorn off of them skip like little lambs once they're released they run around skipping these old sheep run around skipping because they're so happy to be free of that they stand silently before their shearers so when it's time to be slaughtered they don't know any different they come and they stand silently before the butcher who's the same guy as the shearer he's just got a different instrument in his hand they don't know any different they're not crying out and that's exactly what jesus did right he was silent before his shearers he did, not come, he did not come before those who were judging him and committing him to execution. He did not come with his case ready to plead before them. He did not open his mouth like everyone who feels like they're unjustly treated, unjustly tried, and says, I'm innocent. The one person throughout all of history that could have made that claim legitimately rightly claiming to be innocent, the one who should have opened his mouth and said, you're wrong, I did nothing, 
stayed silent. As a sheep before its shearers is silent. He remained silent. And, and the, the Jewish council, the chief priest, the scribes, uh, Herod, Pilate, they were all amazed by that. They couldn't get it. They couldn't figure it out. But he was there. He did that for you. He took your sin. As we just looked in all of these verses, verse after verse after verse, he took your iniquities. He took your sin. He was wounded for your transgressions. It's by his stripes that you are healed. He endured that for you. And by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people? And that verse, like verses 4 and 5 and several others in this passage, those verbs in the verse, if you look at the, the verbs in the verse, they're in the past tense. And scholars call that the prophetic past tense. It's written in a manner that is sure. There's a certainty. There's a a surety that these things will come about so much so that I'm going to put them in the past tense as though they've already happened. That's how clear the prophecy is about Jesus fulfilling each one of these things. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. And so here's an innocent one, the spot, spotless lamb of God. I just finished in my own reading, uh, reading through Leviticus. And uh, you can't read Leviticus without hearing over and over and over again about the sacrifices that are to be made being spotless or without blemish. It's, require, it's, it, it's a requirement for every sacrifice. And here's the spotless Lamb of God, the spotless one, the, the one without blemish. He had done no violence. There was no deceit in his mouth. And they make his grave with the wicked. And he's buried in a rich man's tomb. This is the one who offers atonement for you and for me. This is the one who pays the price for our sin. So he's the exalted servant and the atoning servant. He's also the one who has the victory, the victory of the servant. Listen to these last three verses. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offering, offspring. He shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. Listen to this. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. He is the victorious servant. To the victor go the spoils. And you and I are the spoils. He gains us through his victory. He brings many to righteousness. We had uh, our presbytery meetings up in Chandler this weekend, uh, well, on Thursday and Friday. And on Friday, one of our pastors, uh, Philip Glassmeyer, great first name, great guy, uh, Philip Glassmeyer shared his um, experiences as a pastor. We, we have a different pastor do that every presbytery meeting. And so he was talking about his ministry and his church. And he, he talked about um, some missions trips that he went on uh, in early in his uh, pastorate. And uh, to Haiti. And one of the responsibilities that he was given when he was on those trips was what he called the scabies wash. Now, scabies is a, um, a very, uh, it's, it's a harsh uh, skin condition caused by human itch mites burrowing under the skin and living there and feeding there. Doesn't that sound appetizing? You ready for lunch? But what they do when they're under the skin is they cause a horrible rash. And, uh, and it's very painful, it's very itchy, but it's very treatable. 
There's this medicine that's been developed that's used when they do, they do a scabies wash to uh, kill the mites, to rid the body of the mites. And so when, when the, the local people hear that the missionaries are there doing a scabies wash, they come in great numbers and they line up outside this little bathhouse and you can see the line extending down the road for, for miles. And they come to this little bathhouse and they, they strip down and they go through this wash from head to toe, and the, the parasites, the mites, are, are killed. They're done away with. But that's not the best part, according to my friend up, up in Chandler. He said, no, the best part is they are all so excited for the new clothes that they receive on the way out of the bathhouse. They've stripped off all these clothes, with, which I'm sure are full of these mites, and those are destroyed, and they receive new clothes after having been cleansed. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that, isn't that exactly what our victorious servant has done for us? As it says in, in verse uh, 11, right in the middle of these three verses, right at the heart of these three verses, by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make money, m- many to be accounted righteous. So it's, it's the cleansing. Our, our atoning servant takes our sin upon himself. And then he gives us his righteousness. He gives us new clothing. We've been cleansed of the iniquity, the parasite of our hearts, the, the sin. He cleanses us with his blood. We're washed clean. And then he gives us a new set of clothing. We're clothed in his righteousness. It's not ours. It's not a righteousness that we come up with. We can't earn it. We can't do anything to get it. It's something that's given to us. This is an astounding and important chapter. And it raises for us perhaps the most important question that we're ever faced with in life. It's more important than who you'll marry. It's more important than where you live. It's more important than uh, what you do with your money. And the question is this, how can an unrighteous person be made right with a righteous God? How can a sinner like you and like me be made right before a perfect and holy God? How can I ever think I could have a relationship with him? How could I ever think that Things could be right between me and God. Well, there's only one way, isn't there? There's only one way to be right with God, and that is to trust in what Jesus has done for you. To trust that what Jesus has done that in taking your sin and giving you his righteousness. Jesus in your place for your sins. That's what it comes down to. To believing that, trusting that, resting in that, And many of you may be sitting here today saying, I did that long ago. And I have no doubt that you did. But are you living in that today? Are you trusting that today? Are you trusting that this afternoon? Are you trusting that tomorrow as you return to work? Uh, Are you trusting in, are you resting in the Jesus that, that took your sin, that died for your sin, that was scourged and beaten and then hung on a cross? Trust him. Trust Him today. Trust trust in Him and rest in what He has done for you. It's the only solution. It's the only answer to the most important question you'll ever face. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we thank You that You have revealed such complicated things to, to us, to rebels, that You've shown us the truth. Lord, we know we know our sin. We know that apart from you and apart from the, from the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf and the fact that we can be clothed in his righteousness, apart from all that, we are without hope. And so, God, stir our hearts, convict our hearts to, to repent, to turn from our sin and to flee to God, to run to God, having been made clean by the blood of Christ, and wearing the righteousness of Christ as our new robes. May we trust that. 
May we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.